What is up, everybody? Ethan Newberry, the Ginger Runner, here for another Ginger Runner Live, episode number 84. And uh, I like to bring this guest on. hes I would think he is the most frequented guest on the show. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I like to bring him on every couple of months, maybe every four weeks or so, just because I love talking to the guy. He's got tons of great stories. He's always training for stuff and reviewing gear. Uh, we always tend to have conversations that can go on for hours and hours talking about gear specifics and, and what we're a fan of at any given point and what's coming out and, and all the, the gear gossip. Uh, so I am joined again tonight by Mr. Brandon Wood, a.k.a. The Gearist. Grab your beverage of choice tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Sit back, relax, and let's get on with the show. Welcome. <laughs> Ginger Runner. Yay! Woo. Welcome. Uh, uh, woo! Uh, super excited to have everyone joining us again on Monday live here for Ginger Runner Live. And uh, my guest tonight, I'm just going to bring him bring him on. No real introduction because he's the, again, I think he's the most frequented guest on the show. Uh, a good friend of mine, super talented dude, doing gear reviews and running tons and biking tons. Uh, Mr. Brandon Wood, aka The Gearist. What is up, man? How are you? What's happening? Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it a ton. Dude, no worries. Yeah, man. Nothing is happening. It's uh, I'm done with summer. I'm really, 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 really done with heat. I'm ready for cold. And, and What's going on in Colorado? I mean, well, it was like 85. It was 70 like last Friday. 70, okay. and it was sunny and gorgeous and like 40 at night. And it's awesome. And now it was 85 today. And I, I'm not trying to make like a forced segue into tonight's topic, but it just happens that I am so freaking done with summer. I, I am just, I'm ready to not go out and overheat. Like even you, I think, had a picture on Instagram yesterday where you were trying to, you know, insert yourself into a water fountain somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't know what is going on uh, in Southern California. And it sounds like in Colorado too. And I think along the West Coast, uh, East Coast, I know we have a lot of viewers tonight. Let me know if this is the same for you guys uh, or even around the, uh, around the globe. It is insanely hot. Uh, we are well into September. We're almost into October, but the temperatures in Southern California, uh, right now, I'm sweating. It is 6 p.m., uh, just a little bit beyond, and we're expected to get into the hundreds again later this week. Like, fun. it is far too hot this late in the summer, and it's been like this all summer long. So in thinking about that and, and talking to Brandon, I'm like, you know what? We need to do a winter episode. Uh, mm. If we can put that out there, if we can start <laughs> talking about winter gear, maybe the world would actually start cooling off a little bit. Uh, so that's kind of the goal for tonight, Brandon, is to talk about upcoming winter gear, things that we're excited about doing and and, and utilizing uh, certain gear and stuff like that uh, for the winter months, because I know they're around the corner, but holy crap, I want them here now. Yeah, I, I agreed. It's not, you know, it's it's like this, I feel like we moved here in 2011, uh, my family and I, and it's been this way every year. And the people that are na native to Colorado, they're like, well, it is what it is, because we do have these 40 degree temperature swings where it gets nice and cool at night and early morning but still man i grew up in virginia and i moved away from there because it was too hot and <laughs> it's just like i am i am ready for some cold weather and i dig on like getting out in like i will go seriously negative 20 i don't care i love being on that stuff i mean it's a bit brutal when it's windy and you're skiing but oh i love cold weather love so yeah i'm i'm stoked and and uh yeah i'm ready to talk about some grr yeah, I'm I'm a fan of seasons. I always have been. And everyone's like, well, why do you live in Southern California? <laughs> and a part of it was because this is the entertainment capital of the world. So right. that's what I moved here to do. And that's what I moved here to pursue. And it's been awesome. Uh, but now I'm like, holy crap, it's just it's still so hot. I want seasons again. Being back up in the Northwest a bunch this summer helped me realize there are still seasons up there, even though it's it's taking a while for fall to really come into play up there. Mm -hmm. It's been continually hot uh, up there as well, but not nearly as hot down as it is uh, down here. Uh, so yes, I'm with you, Brandon. I'm, yeah. I'm totally down for talking about winter gear. If you're watching live and you have questions for us about any gear, whether it's winter related or summer related or anything like that, jump into the chat room, ask some questions. Uh, we will get those across tonight uh, throughout the show because I'll keep my eye on the chat room while we discuss this stuff. So Brandon, what are you looking forward to gear wise? We don't have to talk like specific items quite yet, but uh, maybe a trend or, or just kind of things that you're excited about um, for the winter season. 
Do you know, I kind of, and this is not a running shoe thing uh, or running thing at all per se, but it's more of a, like a kind of getting out there and adventuring thing. And, and I started to get into it last year um, and I have a fantastic, uh, the fantastic tools for it this year. And that is Alpine touring, like getting onto a pair of Alpine touring skis, going back country with some skins and just skinning up and skiing down. And I mean, it's that kind of, you know, it, it, look, as much as anyone can love running at some point in time, you could perhaps come become a little burnt out on it. And so it's like when you can get out and do this thing that just crushes in terms of heart rate training, um, it's just kind of something to mix it up. And so I have an amazing pair of skis, the Whaler 99 from uh, DPS skis, which is just a fantastic ski company out of Salt Lake, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, super light. And so I'm, I'm eager to, to get into that, but I didn't do a whole ton of trail like off-road running last year in deep snow. And I like that. It's a whole lot more work and your miles per minute goes, or your minutes per mile goes like <laughs> well north of 15 in some cases. Right. Yeah. And so, but I'm really eager to get into that um, pretty soon. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one thing that I'm super jealous about, by the way, uh, we didn't, we didn't even talk about this mm -hmm. yet. It's one of the most important things to, for, to talk about with Brandon. Uh, tonight, I will be drinking some Trappist's Rochefort 10. Oh. Uh, I saw it in our beer store, and I had not tried it. It's an authentic Trappist product, so I'm excited about that. Nice. Um, Br Brandon, what are you enjoying this evening? I'm having, and I may have had this before in here, I'm not sure, the uh, Apricot Blonde by Dry Dock uh, Brewery. Oh. It is. I don't think so. This looks new. So it's got like an apricot puree in it. Uh, it's still a full-on like blonde, but I will tell you that it's so good like that apricot puree in there you just down it like crazy and did i did i talk about this thing last time so yeti cooler sent this guy over yes and it's like oh my god i love this thing your beer's like it's ridiculous anyway that seems like a senseless product plug but it's not meant to be it seriously stays cold <laughs> uh well yeti <laughs> products kim and i were actually talking about yeti coolers the other uh the other week because we were at rei and we were admiring some yeti coolers for some adventures and then we saw the price tag and realized, hey, rent this month or buy a cool cooler. <laughs> or buy a cooler. Uh, they're so expensive. Yeti coolers are so expensive. But they look awesome. And they, Bear proof, man. Legit. Bear proof. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by the way, this is incredible. This is, yeah. I just took that first swig of it and it was uh, overwhelmingly amazing. So I'm going to try to sip, sip this. Um, but in response to what you were talking about earlier with the, the alpine skiing and the, um, uh, like skinning and, and that kind of thing. I am so jealous. I am so jealous mm -hmm. of the fact you live so close to snow uh, and beautiful, beautiful back country uh, where the ability to, to, to enjoy that snow uh, is right there at your back, back door. And uh, that's another reason why we're like, so Cal, oh, we love you in your late summers, but give us some snow. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something, you know, I grew up on the East coast. Um, and so being here, is is quite different southeastern virginia and so it's just like I, I always just loved snow so much and just being here is i mean it's amazing you know i mean i can take my kid to like 15 minutes away to rabbit mountain which is one of my favorite places to trail run and uh baby gearist you know, yeah baby gearist and teach her how to snowboard and then try it like i know how to snowboard right i mean we have people that write for gears to know how to snowboard thank god but oh my lord yeah um, and Chuck Hall, by the way, in the chat room is saying, come visit Ethan. I keep telling him that, Chuck. <laughs> it's it's on Kim, mine and Kim's list of things that we have to do. Colorado, the fact that we haven't been there uh, in recent memory is, it's very sad. Because Colorado is just a mecca. We know this. And Brandon has been nothing but welcoming and like, dude, come. We have a room. We have a place Please. for you to stay. So it is, it's on our list, Brandon. Um and I'm all just, Col I just like to give you shit. <laughs> Colorado. Yeah, it's okay. Give it give as much shit as possible. What's up with that? Colorado. I I've been seeing it lately. I say Colorado. Is that too <laughs> snooty? Colorado. Col Colorado. <laughs> that's, that's your New York mentality coming <laughs> it back. Must be. <laughs> uh so uh, are you utilizing any winter gear yet? Are you putting the, anything through the paces, getting some reviews ready? Um, sort of, I have a couple things from Nathan, um, Nathan hydration, Nathan sports on the way, because, uh, one of the things that, you know, I never put into, it never really clicked with me because I didn't use hydration packs and things till I lived here. And then I went out for a pretty long trail run. Um, I guess this is a, a couple years ago and it was really cold and 
I had this water because I was planning on being out for a couple, three hours, whatever. And my hose froze. That sounds like a euphemism, but it's not. My hose to my hydration pack froze <laughs> and I couldn't use it. I mean, so I, here I am getting dehydrated with a thing full of water on my back. And so um, we're working on getting a few things uh, from them that are insulated. They actually sell a kind of, not really aftermarket, but they sell a bladder that is meant to be insulated and things like that. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's one of the things that we're working on. Uh, a lot of the stuff though, I mean, you know, there's not a whole ton that we can do. We have a lot of gear that's apparel, ski apparel and things like that coming in. Yep. In terms of running, we've got a lot of tights coming in. We're about to do, in fact, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, all the ladies of gear. So we have four or five ladies that write for us. They're all going to be doing a series of bra, sports bra and tight and capri reviews. So the point of the sports bras is it's, it's basically the entire thing is everybody's aware of breast cancer, not to take the, you know, any stealing thunder from anybody that uh, is out there raising awareness, but everyone's aware. So what we wanted to take the angle of giving that power of still having that ability to get out and feel something that was still stylish, even though your body's going through whatever it's going through. So one of the things we're looking at is tights apart from just the sports bra. So we've got a lot of kind of out there designs of tights. Um, yeah, I actually looking for a pair that kind of channels some of your fave shirts with some wolves howling at moons and space cats and things on tights because, because cats, Be because cats, <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's excellent. I think tights are, are one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, yeah. it took me uh, a couple seasons to get comfortable rocking the tights, rocking the tights without shorts over the top of them. Yep. Um, but now I think they're the, they're the best thing anybody male or female can add to their, to their winter lineup. I think we talked about this before on other yeah. episodes together. Um, well, that's exciting. I'll keep my eye open for that. Cause I think yeah. uh, Kim, Kim would love to see that. Um, and to, to read up on that kind of stuff. Awesome. Uh, I know that my trend, uh, at least for the coming months is going to be layers and, and talking more yeah. specifically about how you can take advantage of layers rather than getting one single item. That's going to protect you from all the elements is utilizing uh, thinner, more accurately defined layers to help keep you warm, dry, um, uh, letting the sweat evaporate, like taking yep. advantage of those types of materials and, and really high quality pieces. Uh, Southern California will have no winter this year. As someone in the chat room was even saying like, that's the best. I love being able to throw on short shorts and go running year round. Um, it's all well and good, but there's gonna be a lot of people that do not get that. Um, so they'll need to utilize these uh, specific types of layers. And there's another comment in here saying that the awkward moment when the gearist has a better microphone than the ginger runner. I think we have the exact same microphone, actually. Yours is the blue uh, snowball? Snowball. The Yours snowball. is the Yeti? It's the Yeti, which is the exact same microphone, just in a different body. So I think yours is also meant equal. to be used in more... You can. I don't know. I haven't worked out how I can set mine below the camera. I don't think the sound would be as good if I put it down here. Oh so. right, does it? It comes with a stand, yeah. It does, but but the stand would I, it would be too a mess, low. Trust me. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be a mess. Uh, so we're equal, guys. Look, the, the the mic is the exact same. It's just it just looks different, uh, and you can't. Kumbaya, see bitches. <laughs> Kumbaya, bitches. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's let's start talking about specific gear type things, man. Uh, I know that you put a lot of things through the gauntlet, the gearist gauntlet. You're always reviewing whether it's shoes or or hydration packs or mm -hmm. layers. Uh, what do you got on your list right now that you are thinking might be a go to or or perhaps uh, something that you're trying for for the winter season upcoming? Well, one thing. I'll pick it up that we already reviewed. Uh, we kind of because we had the late snow. I mean, it was snowing here like May. 15th or some nonsense like that um and so i got the chance to get this out the door and this is the patagonia storm racer jacket uh this guy right here which is really spectacular uh, i've really liked it it's very lightweight it's not something that's really super pa i mean i guess it's packable i've taken it on bike rides before but mm -hmm. it's just really up for anything and one of the things for me because i'm a heavy sweater um, and we mentioned this in the review <clears throat> is that the inside of the thing is textured so there's like i would hold up to the camera but i doubt anybody would be able to see there's this texture that kind of keeps it away from your skin so if you're heavy sweater you know things stick to you and it drives me crazy this stays away from your skin and allows that air to keep flowing so it's a this is one of my favorite pieces that i'm really looking on or excuse me looking at getting some uh more miles in just because it's such a solid piece it's got a great 
hood, no pockets except for one pocket. Mm -hmm. And that's on the inside of the left breast. Uh, that's kind of one of my detractors, but it's just fantastic for biking or for running. It's got great like elongated sleeves, a drop tail, uh, vents all over the place. It's got vents right on the biceps, vents on the back. It's just a really solid uh, piece. I don't know that it's it's not down unless you're layering, like you were mentioning, and I have yeah. some layering pieces also. Unless you're really layering, it's going to probably be a little bit cool once it hits maybe once it hits the 30s or 20s, of course, depending on your tolerance. Uh, it might um, be kind of in that area. And actually, Pete Cressock in the chat room saying any recommend recommendations for a lightweight waterproof rain jacket. Yeah, this thing. Uh, this is fantastic. I mean, but it's not like if you're looking for a casual jacket, again, there are no pockets except for that breast pocket. But it's Patagonia, so expect to pay a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's somewhere <laughs> close to two or 300. Yeah, it's 250 maybe. It's not cheap. By any their, stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yeah, in my experience, their gear has always stood the test of time and stood the test of wear. Absolutely. Uh, and I definitely like their their moral policy as far as how they manufacture all their goods. I like the jacket, and I'm going to kind of dovetail in that jacket department. And this is um, so before Cascade Crest, when the weather forecast was abysmal. Uh, basically, when I figured out, oh, it's going to be dumping rain and and get really really cold, I knew I had to get some sort of waterproof layer that was breathable would keep me warm and protect me um and i managed to get uh outdoor you can't even see the logo on it uh outdoor research uh jacket here which i have it kind of folded into its own pouch which it which it does uh very nicely is uh, that the same uh, as this right here i believe uh, this is the helium two. is yours the helium yeah two? yeah yeah helium two it's a super thin, completely waterproof hooded uh, jacket, again with one pocket. I, I don't know why this seems to be the trend in, in your, uh, minimal gear, but it has one zipper pocket on the front that is also waterproof. Uh, wearing this during that race was an absolute like joy, blast, saint. Uh, as it were. <laughs> as it were, the jacket saved me. The jacket totally saved my race by being completely waterproof and keeping all of the terrible, terrible uh, elements out of my protective shell. Um, I really fell in love with this jacket and what I anticipated just returning after the race uh, because I wouldn't need it, I kept um, because I knew I would use it at some point in the future. I absolutely love this jacket. The Helium 2 from Outdoor Research uh, it is less expensive than the Patagonia. Mm -hmm. It is under $200. I believe it was 170 ish And mm -hmm. I know that you can probably find it on sale or, or get a discount on it, but um, I love it. Absolutely love it. You got one too. Uh, I do. It's it's great. Uh, the The pocket thing, I get it that it's a running jacket. You know, I get right. it that it's minimal. It's for high alpine stuff. It It's kind of like, though, I wear, I mean, you and your wife are the same way. You guys, if you're not in some form of running clothes or workout clothes, it's an oddity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think you guys were the streamies last week and Kim was like, check it out. Even on the red carpet, I'm in... <laughs> jogging gear <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like you know uh i i kind of want to wear this out sometimes and i'm like well i don't have any place you know i don't have any pockets so um but yeah it's a great jacket really super lightweight uh i love it you know it just keeps that water away it's actually good decent as a cycling jacket it doesn't have quite the reach across the back of the shoulders that i might need for something like that um sure kimosabi 75 in the chat room says how important is it to use special laundry detergent for waterproof gear to be honest, with all my gear, with all my like tech stuff, I don't use a special detergent. We tend to use like free detergents, you know, like it's pretty fragrance and all that kind of stuff. But I never, ever, ever dry anything, ever. I just hang it up. And like, it's kind of ridiculous when it's like mostly my laundry because they're only like, you know, two socks and a pair of underwear and a bra that goes into the dryer and everything else is hung out on doors and things. Um, I do that with, I started doing that when I was just cycling and swim, bike and running. And so bike gear, you know, the spandex, you'll, you'll kill spandex, uh, yeah. with drying it. So I don't dry anything pretty much. Mm -hmm. And as far as like extra detergents or special detergents, I'm with Brandon. I don't use anything that's like designed for sports apparel. I, I, I think mm -hmm. that's also kind of a marketing gimmick, but it's the same thing. Like you, as long as you just take care of your items, uh, they tend to last uh, a lot longer. This particular jacket or any sort of waterproof jacket, 
you're, you're getting two things. You're getting a thin material that is the waterproof membrane. Mm -hmm. Then you're also getting a coating. There's always some sort of aqua repellent coating on the outside of these waterproof jackets, even water resistant jackets, which is just the coating. Uh, that will eventually wear off or wash off. But if it's a waterproof jacket, the material itself will retain its waterproofness. So, you know, you can wash it and wash it and wash it. It will always stay waterproof. Um, and he asked, Kimisabe also continued to ask about using the waterproof detergents or if you take a non-waterproof item and throw it in the washer with those waterproof detergents, uh, would we recommend that? I don't necessarily recommend that because again, it's a temporary solution right. to something uh, that you should probably just get a, a legitimate piece of gear for. Brandon, I don't know if you've ever used that stuff. I haven't, but I was, you know, I, I did this, uh, we did a video last year, top 10 kind of um, uh, winter gear things and number 11, the bonus for our top 10 was Scotchgard. And at the end of the day, yeah. if you don't want to, and I'm not, I'm not, certainly not validating anybody going out and spending three quarters of your paycheck on gear. Although wouldn't it be nice if we all could, right. um, get some scotch guard, just straight up scotch guard target. Your grocery store probably has it. Um, and spray that on whatever, especially if it's a pair of shoes or something that's about to fall out of your rotation. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, yeah. If you can, yeah, if you're, if you're on a budget where $200 or $300 just isn't even feasible, which is a lot of us. Cause that's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, Scotchgard for sure. Throw it. Yeah, there you go. Look at look at this. Yeah, dude. That'll do it. That'll give you um the the protection that you might need for a couple outings. Yeah, and and then you can just kind of spray it. On. I know it's not the greatest thing in the world. It's certainly not gonna do what a waterproof membrane like a Gore-Tex or something like that is gonna mm -hmm. do. But or even the pro, what is it? The Power Shield Plus from uh or Pro Shield from uh, why can't I think? Oh, well, whatever. Pro Shield. Google it. Somebody. <laughs> uh, a question from Kristen in the chat room. What about lightweight waterproof jackets that breathe for us people down here in the hot south? Uh, I mean, the Houdini, or this, this, the Houdini is the Patagonia. Uh, what the hell is the name of this one again? It's the Helium the, 2. Helium. I keep wanting to call it the Houdini. The Helium 2 is super lightweight, but it is not very breathable. Uh, it will retain the warmth within. So I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. The Houdini, which does, there is a waterproof version of the Houdini out from Patagonia. Uh, it's harder to find because I think it was a limited edition release or some, it was like one of their emergency uh, releases where uh, it was meant specifically as a carry on emergency layer. Uh, I think you can find that. That is very lightweight, a fraction of some of the weights of some of these lightweight jackets it is also waterproof and i believe it would be breathable as well because uh the the pad the patagonia houdini first round of that jacket is super lightweight super breathable i have one of those and i wear it all the time as an extra layer and you can carry that thing and not even realize you're carrying it it's yeah. just a couple of ounces it's really really good i found that a lot of those things the the breathability as it were is really dependent upon your sweat rate and the humidity of your climate you know and for me I have yet to find something. I found plenty of things that are breathable, right? Mm -hmm. But when I get really going and I'm really sweating and it's borderline, I'd, I'd much rather just deal with the moisture and something that's not waterproof at all, something like uh, merino wool or something, and let myself get damp because now I'm not talking about on like, you know, Cascade Crest where you had a legitimate issue with cold, not like that because God knows you don't want to go down that road. But when you're, when you're kind of trying to make sure you've got these things balanced uh, for me, I can't find something that can keep the breathability can't keep up with my sweat, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So I'm still searching for that. I have a lot of things like this guy, this, this is a packable jacket from ASICS, the helium two we talked about. I really do like the, uh, the Patagonia storm racer. And for me, breathability is less about the fabric. I mean, partially about the fabric, but less about the fabric than it is where the vents are placed. Yeah. And this thing, like the front of those those bicep vents, I mean, it's like a big unzipped, no mesh backed vent right on your bicep, and it goes straight out the back, and it's it's great like that in keeping that air flowing, you know, and it and it makes you feel like there's much more breathability, even though it's not once you've got it zipped up. So, yeah, and the helium jacket, which we both talked about, has no vents at all. Mm -hmm. So it is a jacket that is designed to keep your body heat in, keep the moisture out and allow whatever minimal amount of evaporation to occur. 
uh, during Cascade Crest, I needed that. I needed something that kept the heat in. Um, it was a whole cyclical problem, though. Like the heat would stay in, I would sweat, the sweat would turn cold, and it would be this whole. It was a whole mess of stuff. Uh, so there were other issues involved. But yeah, check out your sweat rate. See, are you a heavy sweater? Are you a light sweater? Is it as easy as solving by just unzipping whatever jacket you end up getting? Or do you need what Brandon is talking about? Where these vents that are built into the jacket, keep your eyes open for that. Because I think that's mm -hmm. a, a crucial um, uh, feature to, to look for in your jackets. Uh, what about uh, other gear, Brandon? Um, shoe wise, I got some shoes. I got some other things to talk about. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, sorry, grabbing a couple things. So <laughs> the first one, now I, I, I feel like I want to put this caveat out there and I did this, I kind of did a rehash of that winter video today for a race in Chicago called the abominable snow race. Um, and I, I want to say that before we talk about shoes, you got to think about it like four wheel drive, right? Four wheel drive on ice means dick. Four wheel drive on snow is awesome. And no shoe, no shoe, unless it's studded, no shoe is going to do well on ice, period. The, you can fix your technique around a shoe. If you land very much under your body, you're probably going to be better off than if you overstride or really drive off with your toe. But no shoe, unless it's studded, is really going to handle ice well. Uh, it's just like four-wheel drive on ice is just four wheels spinning around as you spin into a telephone pole instead of two wheels spinning around as you spin into a telephone pole. So... For snow and junk, this shoe I've really liked, uh, the the Mutant from La Sportiva, which I yep. believe you checked out too, yeah? Uh, I have not checked it out. I've, I've played with it in stores and stuff like that, yeah. but I remember you talking about it last time you were on, yeah. I it's think you've just gotten it. Right. It's really great. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Interesting lacing system. I, I don't know, like relacing it would kind of be a pain in the butt, but um, just great lugs, you know, and anything like this, like a speed cross from Solomon. And actually Solomon has what's called the snow cross, which is a kind of high top version of the speed cross with carbide studs already in it. Um, and a shoe like that would be great, but just for snow, I mean, you could get away with pretty much any trail shoe on snow, but then on ice, you want a studded shoe. And, you know, I have the hobnails here <laughs> from, uh, La Sportiva. Also, you know, that makes the mutant here. And these little guys, these little really just terrorizing looking little spike dealies that kind of screw into the bottom of your shoe. Um, and instead of a normal screw, the thread is much deeper. I'll hold up the camera. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. But the thread is much deeper, so it holds the rubber better. And then there are carbide tips on the end uh, to really dig into the snow and ice. And they come with a little toolkit, but they're $40. The alternative yeah. would be that you could go to Home Depot, buy a couple packages of hex-headed screws like this, find a pair of old shoes. This is the Kinvara 1. Yeah, Bubba. And, <laughs> uh, and screw them in there. I mean, they just go right around the perimeter, wherever you feel like is best. And you've got yourself an ice shoe. Uh, we actually did a tutorial on these on our, on our YouTube channel because it's just such a very, very handy and very cheap. I mean, what if you lose one of these hobnails? You you know, you're out essentially a new kit of hobnails, which is 40 bucks. With these, you're out. You lose one, you're out of nickel. So, I mean, yeah, that's I, I dig on those. Uh, for ice, of course, again, this is where Scotch Guard or something's going to come into play. Yep. But just keep in mind, everybody needs to keep in mind that if you go out in a trail shoe and you're going to run on ice, and you you, it's not fair to turn around and go, this trail shoe sucks. It can't handle ice. No trail shoe can handle ice. It's especially the smoother it is, the worse it's going to be. There was a trail that Kim and I ran last year uh, in Oregon when we left. Uh, our, we were staying in a cabin up on Mount Hood. And when we left, I think I've talked about this on the show before. Uh, when we left the house, we grabbed our trail shoes with big lugs, knowing that we were going to be, be encountering snow. It doesn't matter how big the lugs are. It doesn't matter how grippy the rubber is. It will not grip on ice. Uh, we ended up having to turn around because the trail got so icy uh, and we didn't have micro spikes or those wonderful screws, which Brandon has talked about on the show before. And Kimo Sabi mentioned being a fantastic tip uh, that he's used. Uh, we didn't have anything like that. So it was a terrible idea to continue. So we didn't, uh, we turned around and came back. Yeah. Um, 
totally agree. I have not tried the Las Portiva Mutants. Um, I know that Brandon, you you like them. Uh, they seem to be really good in, in some sloppy conditions and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, the shoe that I was going to talk about a little bit tonight is one I just I just got my feet into it, so I'm still uh, formulating my thoughts and reviews and stuff. I probably have maybe 10, 10 or 15 miles in it. Um, and that is this, the Solomon S Lab Wings. Uh, I have talked multiple times about Solomon shoes and products on the show. Uh, I review them fairly frequently because they always come out with new stuff. Um, some things I really, really like, some things I don't. One thing they all have in common is essentially a pretty solid build quality and rugged outsoles. Even their more minimal trail shoes tend to have some sort of contra grip rubber, uh, some pretty substantial outsoles. I think with this shoe, what I like about this shoe for winter running, not ice, but uh, probably like decent snow, um, nothing too deep where you might actually need real lugs or muddy conditions. But this seems to be a hybrid outsole that I was not expecting from a Solomon shoe. Uh, in the past, I've seen speed crosses that have the huge lugs. Uh, they also have the more minimal, I think X-Series, Brennan, you and I were talking about that. Yep. The X-Series is more of a road shoe, but yet it still works for buffed out single track. Uh, so they kind of go one way or the other, extreme in one direction or the other. This is the first shoe that I really tried from them that has this outsole that could work for a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. It would work for, for road, for single track, for buffed out stuff, but also a little bit of nasty trail conditions, whether it's uh, rain and mud or possible light snow, stuff like that. So I'm really excited to actually try this shoe in elements because uh, I like the build quality. Uh, it tends to have tons of protection and a good kind of protected overlay, welded overlay on the toe box and stuff like that. But it's, it's a nice aggressive outsole, but not too aggressive where it completely limits you to what trails or conditions you can run in, like the speed crosses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't really run in speed crosses on on trails that are dry because the lugs just are pointless. Uh, whereas this kind of covers the, the the ground in between. So this is the shoe that I'm kind of excited about to try in conditions as soon as conditions change here, which I don't anticipate happening anytime soon. El Nino. El Nino. <laughs> the rain is coming. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's supposed to be terrible here this winter, and I anticipate it will be. But right now, it's 100 freaking degrees outside, uh, and our air conditioner is turning it into an 86 degree inside, so it's not helping a ton. Uh, there was a great question in the chat room, Brandon. Mm. How do you decide whether to bring a lightweight water-resistant jacket or a heavier waterproof jacket on a long run or race? That is from Kim Espat. So I personally always go, I, I dress as though it's 10 to 15 degrees warmer than it actually is because I know that I run hot. So now I think that there's like a, there's, there's a line of demarcation with that, right? So Ethan, uh, you from time to time, if I'm not mistaken, can run hot also. But then when you get into a situation like Cascade Crest where it's hot, your resources in terms of nutrition are, are depleted. And your body is basically in some variation of shutdown, which even the most professional athlete is at some point of shutdown when they hit, you know, 80 miles. So yeah, cascade was cold. It was very cold. Right. And when you, when you hit that spot, it's kind of like, that's a different animal. But if I'm going out for 10 or 15 miles or something, or uh, mileage is a kind of a misnomer. Let's say I'm going out for two hours or three hours. If you, if I'm going out, regardless of the distance, I'm still out for two or three hours. So I have to account for well, what is my effort going to be like? How hot do I think I'm going to get? Because again, if you're running and you get sweaty, which you will, or I will anyway, you're going to immediately start evaporating in heat. So as soon as you stop running, you are going to be so cold, even though you were just so warm. <laughs> so I don't really have criteria for figuring out which layer I'm going to take. I think it really, I just kind of balance it based around how I'm feeling. Um, if it's really coming down in terms of snow, uh, I'll take a waterproof layer that's a little heavier. Uh, but, you know, I, I, again, I've run, when I lived in New York City, I ran in temperatures that were uh, wind chills of 40 degrees below zero. Yeah. And, and that is, you want to talk about cold. Um, that was great because I had the right gear on, but I also dressed as though it were closer, this is going to sound weird, but as though it were closer to zero. Uh, you know, so 
I don't know. I guess that's my answer is there is no real answer. I just kind of base it on how I'm feeling. I don't have like a line of demarcation because maybe one day I go out, it's 20 degrees, but it's sunny. I'm not going to need necessarily as much as I will need if it's 20 degrees and overcast or 20 degrees at night. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, it's a tough, it's also a tough question to answer specifically. Like you said, it's, it's always going to be a, con a contribution of multiple factors. Um, duration expected to be out in these conditions, mm -hmm. the level of severity of the conditions, uh, your ability to create body heat. Uh, are you a, are you typically a hot blooded person or a cold blooded person? I know that both my wife and I are, are the complete opposites. I tend to favor cold weather. She just, she runs a little bit hotter, but also favors cold weather, but our layers will be different. Mm -hmm. Um, I will always look, I will always dress for the temperature, not the weather. So mm -hmm. it could be snowing uh, or I'm, it could be raining and it could also be 65 degrees and raining. So that will still keep me in shorts. Like I'm not going to uh, bundle up because, oh God, rain. Um, but if it's just dumping and I know I'm going to be out there for a long time, that could dictate that, oh, I do wear a waterproof jacket up top just to keep me dry longer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's a whole series of factors uh, to help answer your question, Kim. It's a, it's a good question. I, I think it's going to be completely individual uh, based off a series of factors, I think, in this case. Yeah, I, I think that um, I, I for like tights, for instance, is actually a better line of demarcation for me. I'll run in shorts down to 40 degrees, pretty much, 38 maybe. Um, and then I'm in tights. And But I have like a range of tights too, and I, you know, so I know that, but apart from that, you're right. I mean, you just have to kind of balance it out and see what's what, what makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about the next little product. I'll start, Brandon. I think you might have something that you're going to talk about that is in the same vein. Uh, and that is... Oy, now it's stuck on my jacket. Uh, pulse. Um, oh, we have to say pulse. <laughs> are they the same ones? The ultra distance? Yes. Ultra, yep, same ones. Carbon or aluminum? Carbon. <laughs> So Brandon and I are going to talk about the exact same product. Uh, <laughs> I won't this, take this, mine out. <laughs> uh, but I will say that this probably just proves their ability to be versatile and good. This is the Black Diamond uh, Ultra Distance Carbon Fiber Z-Poles. Um, I am a, a huge fan of these. I used them for the first time during Cascade Crest. And I didn't think that I would be a huge pole fan or a pole person. Uh, they kept me upright. They kept me moving. And they kept three points of contact on the ground at any really given time, mm -hmm. uh, which I really, really enjoyed. I don't want to talk too much about them because I, I feel like Brandon also has some thoughts. No, well, I, you know, I have those and I, I have another pair that I really love that I cannot find. They're by Lecky. They're the Speed Tour or the, the Vario Tour Stick or something like that. And they're an excellent pole because they're a four season pole. They're great for trekking, great for running, great for skiing. Um, and these are too, these are starting adjustable. That's the downside of the Z poles is that you get to choose from one of, I believe three sizes and that's pretty much it. You can't yeah. really, there's no adjusting it. Um, I love the weight of the Z pole. They're fantastic. Uh, and when you're, when you're winter running or you're snowshoeing, snowshoeing is by the way, another just amazing, so fun, so peaceful, um, uh, winter activity, whether you're running on snowshoes, which you can do or not, you're just out for a walk or a hike. Um, but you know, when you touched on this, I think the last time or a couple times before that, when I was on with you, um, and it was the use of poles apart from the three points of contact on the ground is the fact that you can begin to feel your way, use them almost like a, a, a like a, I hate to make this comparison because it's really not fair, but as though like a blind person's stick, you're feeling your way in what's under that snow that you cannot see, especially if you're on really rocky terrain, what are you going to do? You know, but these are going to, again, add kind of like almost an, a sixth sense out there, really feeling what's under that snow. And of course on deeper snow, it's more of an issue, but I mean, here as Lori and Chuck Hall, who are watching right now online, will find out very soon when it snows and I take them up to, um, one of the places up here, the snow, you can have, you can go back into forests at some places and no joke, have four feet of snow, but it's so light, you know, it doesn't, you can't see anything. And when you push your foot down in it, it's just like, it's the most powdery stuff in the world. And it just kind of falls back over your foot. So you still can't see. 
So apart from the fact that it keeps those points of contact, it allows you to kind of feel your way a little bit additionally. I was recently researching an adventure up in Washington in the Olympic mountains called the Bailey Traverse. Mm. And it's a very rugged remote traverse of, uh, of the Bailey mountain range, which basically encircles Mount Olympus uh, in the Olympic mountain range. At this point, it, it's less of an issue. Um, there's not a lot of snow up there, but there are glaciers there are glaciers that are there year round uh, and they're melting. Uh, they're melting away. They're disappearing. Um, Animal Athletics out of Portland, Washington, recently did an excursion out there. I believe it was Willie McBride. I don't think Yassine did it, but I believe Willie did. And they were talking about how on, on one of the descents, some of the glaciers, uh, they, they had a really difficult time trying to figure out the depth of the snow because there's a river that runs underneath that glacier and can hollow out a giant cave. And now the glacier is uh, melting a lot. So you never know how thick or thin that, that glacier is. Having something like this may not be a complete savior, but it is 100% a tool that could benefit you uh, in huge ways by simply, you know, poking the ice ahead yep. of you and figuring out if there is in fact a, a depth issue ahead of you. Uh, I can't imagine, uh, I, I don't want to say this is the answer to that problem. I think there's probably other tools sure. out there that will do that. But I do remember reading um, a couple of reports from people doing the traverse that poles are a huge savior in that sense. So if you're well, looking actually, at that kind of thing. Yeah, they actually have, you know, probes and things like that. Um, yeah. And on, on that note real quick is that Pete in the chat room says he heard carbon fiber poles break easier than aluminum. Have you heard any trouble with this? Had any trouble with this? I, I've not, I don't have any aluminum poles. I have a pair of ski poles that are Bluebird, also by Lecky, that are kind of a hybrid. The lower portion is aluminum, the upper portion is carbon. The thing is that carbon fiber doesn't bend. Aluminum bends. When carbon fiber hits its breaking point, for aluminum, yeah. that breaking point just bends. For carbon, it's catastrophic because that's just the nature of the beast. There's no... It's not always catastrophic, but pretty much always. So if that helps, I mean, yeah, I... I yeah. I know people who have broken their carbon poles. Gary Robbins during his Mount Rainier mm. FKT broke mm. one of his carbon poles. It snapped. He got it stuck between two rocks as he was pushing forward and it just, it literally, he just pulled a joystick and it snapped. Yeah. Um, so that became, that complete, it became complete garbage to him. He couldn't, he didn't want to carry it because it was just excess weight. Uh, with aluminum, you're right. It would, it would bend. So he would still have his pole in one piece and he could, potentially bend it back but then your pole uh it, it's no longer the the single piece that it once was compromise Ult yeah. Com yeah, compromise exactly that's what i was looking for ultra ped pedestrian uh Roz, i think he's on an adventure right now in arizona but i remember reading that he had a carbon pole that broke on an adventure and he took sticks and essentially made a pole splint Mm. Uh, he took sticks and ran it along it and then taped it up with uh, duct tape and it basically was a working carbon fiber Z pole all over again um, because it it like you said it snaps so you yeah. have a breaking point a clear breaking point it didn't uh, bend so he was able to make it work I definitely think these will are a little bit more fragile than, than aluminum but I also believe black diamond stands by their product uh, pretty yeah. wholeheartedly so if you were to reach out and say hey your pole broke. What's up with that? What's up with that? <laughs> I think they'd be like, oh, well, you know, we'll send you a new pole or something. Yeah. Uh, what other gear, Brandon? Anything else in your uh, gear dungeon? Yes, I have. Well, actually, I have, so uh, I believe I believe it's called their BioViz line that Pearl Azumi just came out with. Uh, yes. They, with, yeah. Mm -hmm. With their new PR agency, which is fun. This is their Flash Insulator Run Jacket, and it's kind of this retro styling. I really like it a lot. Um, it's just kind of, I mean, you can see there, it's kind of got that really retro kind of insulated front. It's got pretty much not insulated sleeves like this, but I mean, it's just, I haven't been able to run it yet, but it looks dope. And somebody was asking about gloves and mittens and everything in the chat room. And, um, this pair right here, what's great about these guys, these are a pair of gloves by Pearl Azumi, also not part of their BioViz line which are very visible. The fingers operate your, the thumb rather, and the forefinger will uh, work your smartphone. But then you've got the mitten that pulls out here. So, so you get that sure. collective war because people don't, I, I don't know that everyone realizes. I mean, maybe more people realize than I think, but um, the, 
collective warmth of a hand inside of a chamber is much more warm than individual fingers. So in a glove, it's not necessarily going to be as warm as it will be in a mitten because in a mitten, all your fingers are together. So you've got four little, you know, sticks of heat. That sounds weird. Creating this collective heat instead of an individual finger trying to warm up itself. Um, so I really like these. It's pretty seldom um, that those aren't enough. But if they're not enough, and these are part of, these are yet to come out, I think, part of Pearl's uh, BioViz line. These are their, I don't know what these are called. I think it's just called a winter mitt. But they have this weird lobster claw thing. So if you're not familiar with what, what, what that's for, anybody on the camera, is that these are for cycling. You know, cycling, in, of course, you can run in them because when you're cycling, you need these fingers to be free to shift and use your brakes and things like that. So they're trying to keep the, the pinky finger and the ring finger kind of grouped together because those are typically up around the backside of the hoods on a bike. Uh, and these fingers are for shifting. Um, these are, I haven't used them yet, but I have another pair by Segoy that have actually the first three fingers, the, the middle finger, ring finger, and small finger together, and then just these two fingers. And in any event, I have never been in a pair of gloves like these um, where my hands have not been sweating during run. And I, that includes like really cold runs where I have to have them because a glove like this thinner one is not enough. Um, but these are awesome in terms of that. I, I love a good solid glove. And you got the like this part right here, which this is going to be gross. So everybody brace yourselves. But this little part that's nice and soft, you know what that's Ew. for? That's for <laughs> snot. <laughs> and sweat that's what it's for because whose nose doesn't run when you're running and it's cold outside much less when it's hot outside i mean that's what that's for so it's just a really well put together glove comes up really high like halfway up my forearm you can cinch it down with one hand instead of having to worry about two hands and you've got the additional kind of closure here to make it tighter on the wrist and seal that out so you're essentially using the top part as a, a wrist gaiter almost Jonathan is saying, Star Trek it, Gearist. And uh, you know, with, with those gloves on, it's definitely a live long and prosper scenario. It's not that hard. <laughs> um, they, I am a huge fan of mittens over gloves uh, just because of the heat thing where a collective series of fingers mm -hmm. can contribute to a warmer glove than five individually separated fingers. Totally, totally on board with that. Uh, the problem is that I tend not to want to run uh without having nimble fingers right like you want to mm -hmm. be able to operate your smartphone you want to be able to tactily engage a fence and open the gate and be able to walk that kind of thing uh so i always tend to run with five finger gloves uh i have a pair of north face and i also have a pair of pearl Azumi, which i think are fantastic they're just like a, a a nice warm layer um minimal protection not waterproof by any means but they do have the engage your cell phone fingertips, which I think is really mm -hmm. helpful. But they came in the chat room, mentioned what I was going to talk about with gloves. Uh, there's a ultimate direction jacket that I don't think is available publicly yet. And we're hopefully getting a review piece here soon, but uh, it is their new waterproof jacket that they've been working on for quite a while. And in the arms are built in waterproof mittens. Uh, I will say, again, I'm going back to Cascade Crest because it is my most recent experience with freezing cold weather. And uh, pretty much the last time I actually remember being cold uh, was at Cascade Crest. I was running with just regular gloves that I normally run with when the weather is cold. But when your hands started getting soaking wet and really freezing, Kim had a pair of North Face waterproof mittens. They're just a shell. It's really thin. Uh, they don't provide any sort of warmth because there's no fleece or anything like that, but just pulling those over my fingertips and turning my fingertips into a mitten mm -hmm. basically allowed me to, to, uh, uh, to keep hypothermia at bay and keep my hands from violently shaking uh, mm -hmm. for a large portion of that run. So I'm a huge fan of the mittens over regular gloves, even if you're already uh, past the point of keeping your fingers protected from the cold. They can always they can always help. And that UD jacket I'm really excited about because it provides weather protection as well as hand protection. I, I'd like to add real quick, uh, and this is kind of something that doesn't really apply for gloves uh, per se, but everybody should really pay attention. Like if you're going to be running in an insulating, insulating layer, um, you should look at things that are natural fabrics um, and fabrics that are, that are natural fabrics, but still treated 
to uh, deal with things. For instance, merino wool is a really great thing. Or, or in, in the case of this thing, actually, where did it go? It's by this company called Cora. And this is made of yak wool. That's right, yak wool. And it's a base layer. Now, the downside is that it's stupid expensive. But it's really supposed to be that much like double the how you doings of uh, merino wool. So it's an excellent piece able to be wrung out. And while taking your shirt off in the middle of, you know, 20 degrees might not seem like the greatest thing in the world. Number one, it's probably going to wick away moisture quicker than you keep up with it anyway. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that is the better decision. And then you get to things like this guy, which is part of Eddie Bauer's first ascent line. It's just a down vest, right? The kind of <clears throat> ubiquitous, um, you know, college campus preppy vest looking thing. However, this Eddie has Eddie Bauer. Eddie Bauer first ascent. They're still yeah. around. Hell yeah, dude. Um, they this vest. What's great about it is it has you uses storm down, um, kind of an off take on down tech. And the great part about that is that it's natural down which, you know, we could have a whole discussion on that, but it's natural down that is treated to be water repellent. So there are companies that are coming up with things like this, like they have the turbo ball that was in uh, North Face products last year, and it still is this year, where people will literally take as a test, put it in a creek overnight, <laughs> take the thing out and just wring it out. And it's ready to go. I mean, sure, the exterior part is going to be a little bit wet, but the warmth is immediate. It doesn't have this kind of catch up time where it has to dry out. And so things like that, where you're not only wearing a insulating piece, but you're also wearing something that's going to keep that weather at bay is going to be such an asset in really cold weather running and cold weather adventures in general. I wear, I can't think of a time I went skiing last year in like 40 or 50 days of skiing where I didn't have uh, that vest or a vest like that on because it's just so useful. Jonathan is saying a yak wool vest and badger milk for protein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, what if I, can I mean, find if a badger. If we're if we're talking nutrition during cold weather, why not milk a badger? I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a perfect mix of protein and carbohydrates. Uh, any any tips or tricks as far as uh, nutrition is concerned in cold weather? Now, I haven't been able to run in freezing cold weather with like uh, nutrition in a while as far as what works and what doesn't. Maybe well, you so have. this is actually yeah. Well, number one, hydrate. You know, we talked about it earlier. Um, Anything that is insulated to keep heat out is also going to keep room temperature or it basically if it's meant to run and keep a drink cold and when it's super hot outside, it's also going to keep a drink from freezing to some degree when it's cold outside. So when you're going outside, it's below freezing. It might not, you might go, oh, 32 degrees is not a big deal. I can run in this. This isn't going to freeze. It's 32 degrees. It's probably going to freeze. Yeah. But I will tell you what some people do. Cyclists do this all the time. Um, is they'll put a drop or maybe like a teaspoon, very small amount of whiskey into their water because the freezing point of alcohol is so much lower. So it keeps it from freezing. Um, so that's a good thing. You know, obviously then you have lower blood pressure. There's a whole thing about it getting cold that way. Um, but then in terms of nutrition, solid nutrition, and I'll actually tie this into the cell phone. This is something I want to mention. This pair of tights right here, this is the surge tight from Lululemon. Um, they have these pockets right on the hips that literally just go kind of right on your hips. Um, and what's great about them is that it keeps your phone right next to your skin because cell phones, smartphones in general, don't like hot or cold. So when you're out and it's cold, this is going to keep it next to your body and keep it from shutting down, which it will do. And the same thing goes for like a goo. I mean, if you've ever tried to use a goo when it's like 20 degrees outside, the worst, it's kind of like a weird sort of frozen popsicle sort of, but not a sludge. It's a frozen sludge. <laughs> it's you a can frozen swallow. Sludge. It's terrible. That's true. It's so I, I think that, know what you're know what you're getting into stay hydrated and, and if you're if you're taking solid nutrition i mean i had goo chews or honey stinger chews or something once and it was like 20 degrees outside and it was like chewing on rocks it was like you remember old school now and laters how yeah. they call them now and laters because you were chewing on them now and then going to the dentist later it yeah. was like that <laughs> so if that helps People are loving your whiskey in the water comment, and uh, I believe Phil is already saying, I like a small amount of water in my whiskey. Uh, yeah. I think that's a better way to run. 
fill your bottles with whiskey and then add a little bit of water for hydration purposes. Right. right. Um, <laughs> we're kind of coming to the end of the hour. Brandon, any additional thoughts for preparing for the winter, the oncoming onslaught of El Nino? Uh, any additional insights or advice? Uh, I'd pay attention to humidity. Humidity bites. In, no, I don't mean it as in the like kids that bites. I don't mean it that way. Do kids say that anymore? Anyway, humidity bites. <laughs> humidity bites and it will cut through. I mean, it, and, and it's the same thing with heat, like 85 degrees here. I told my family back in Virginia, I was talking to them yesterday, like 85 degrees. I was like, yeah, but it's but it's a dry heat. <laughs> that old, that old right. chestnut. It, it still is a dry heat, but even in the cold or the heat, you're still dealing with that temperature. So don't be lulled into the fact that it's cold and not humid because it's still cold and you can still pay the price. To oh, take care of your skin. Hold on. I don't know. I have stuff. Crap. I don't have it. It's down here somewhere. I'm not going to look for it. Take care of your skin. Put sunscreen on. If you're running at night when it's cold out, put sunscreen on. Because that sunscreen is going to create a protective barrier. If you don't have any, put A and D ointment. If you have any kids, you definitely have A and D ointment around. Put anything on your face to protect your skin because wind burn and chafing from that combined with cold is no joke. Even if you've got a chamois cream, something that's normally supposed to go on your, you know, juncular region, you your put dixical. that <laughs> your dixical. Put that on your face. I mean keep your keep your skin protected because that is it just won't go away and i mean you know people that like us that can't stay inside i mean what are you gonna do then you wind up wearing a balaclava and i will make fun of you i'm just kidding that's not true <laughs> I, <laughs> I have worn balaclavas before <laughs> protect your skin yeah uh, 100%. Uh, adding just a real thin layer of, of cream or ointment that doesn't um, soak into your skin completely uh, is a huge benefit to keeping your skin from getting chapped, red, irritated, uh, sunburned, even if you're dealing with snow reflection. Uh, there's so many benefits to it. Uh, I could be very, I could, I could be better at uh, more diligent at doing that, I think is it. Um, but I'm also not out in the sun a ton or the snow a ton. Um, but hopefully this winter, that'll be different. The goal this winter is to be able to get on some skis and take advantage of going up and down some slopes. Do you ski? Yeah, I grew up skiing. Uh, I didn't really talk about this, but Cascade Crest 100, one of the main reasons why I chose it was because I grew up skiing on the course. Hmm. I never ran or touched the trails. I only skied it because uh, it basically runs up and down ski slopes and uh, through terrain that is covered by snow a large portion of the year. So it was a, a, a large draw for me was to actually get out onto the same place where I grew up skiing and run it instead. Oh. Yeah, I want to go back. It's it's I, I'm really looking forward to it. I just I'm getting some uh good skins for the the tour with the uh DPS skis I mentioned earlier. And it's just yeah. I mean and added bonus if you're at a resort and you're gonna go up, you don't need a lift ticket. I mean, the lift ticket just gets you on the lift. So you just skin up and you're good to go. You know? That's so true. <laughs> I don't even think I put that logic together. Uh, no. For some reason, I thought you had to have some sort of access pass to the ski slopes. Nope. But you don't. No, sir. You just skin your way up and ski on down. Now, that's awesome. In fact, you can, at a place like Vail, um, where you have kind of midpoint, or, or any resort out here, you have midpoint... Um, uh, lifts, you can kind of just skin up a little ways and then you're above the lift lines where you're still a lift, but they don't scan you when you get on lift. They only skin you at the bottom. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I like this. I like this. Uh, sorry, Julie. Julie's calling out the chat room on uh, getting a little inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> I think I dropped the Dixical earlier and then we started talking about naughty bits and then people are just rubbing all sorts of things on their skin in the chat room. Uh, keep it, keep on it, my friends. Keep rubbing that wonderful stuff on, on whatever you need. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brandon, before we move into the post show, uh, I obviously want to promote as much as possible of your stuff. Where can people find you? Where can people subscribe? Where can people see the gearist in all of his glory? So the biggest thing right now, uh, and I would really, really love if everybody that sees this would subscribe to our channel on YouTube. We have a goal of hitting 7,000 subscribers. I realize it is a pittance compared to the Ginger Runners 41,000 subscribers. <laughs> we have a goal of hitting 7,000 subscribers by the end of this year. And right now, I think we're at uh, 56, maybe. 
Um, so 5,600. Um, so I would really love to hit that last 1,400 in the next 90 days-ish. Uh, so if you don't mind subscribing and then you can share and tell other people to subscribe, that would be really great. And apart from that, just find us on Twitter, Instagram, at TheGearist, and then Gearist.com or TheGearist.com, either way it works. Um, yeah, that would be fantabulous. Nice. Let's get them to 7,000. Uh, I might have 41,000 subscribers. Half of them are amazing. Uh, everyone that's watching live tonight, amazing. But then the other half are just, they're just haters. They just like to, uh, to <laughs> tune down. in and then thumbs down everything. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. 41 is, is an inflated number. Um, I would say 90% are amazing people. And then there's this couple that are like, I dislike everything you do. Uh, so great. Yes. Go follow Brandon. Go subscribe to his channel. Uh, show him some love because he's doing great content and uh, super educational and informative stuff too, very regularly as well, which is uh, fantastic and, and important in trying to make YouTube a, a full-time thing. So go uh, show him some love. And uh, before moving to the post show, thank you for tuning in live every single Monday. A lot of you guys have been back every single episode for 84 episodes, which is mind blowing to me. I really appreciate the consistent support. Uh, you know where to find me on Twitter. It's at the ginger runner. Facebook is the ginger runner. Instagram is at Ethan Newberry. And of course, gingerrunner.com. Uh, we'll be posting a new film this week. Gary Robbins mm -hmm. FKT around Mount Rainier on the Wonderland trail that uh, hopefully we'll be dropping on Friday. It better be dropping on Friday. So uh, look for that. Very excited about it. Really proud of it. And Gary's a full-on badass. And mm -hmm. I hope the film does him some justice because uh, the man deserves as much attention and love and adoration as possible because he's an absolute rock star. Um, that's it. We'll see you guys in the post show. Thanks again for tuning in. Train hard, race harder, party hardest. We'll see you guys in a second. <laughs>
I, I know how detailed and specific you can get because you're just super knowledgeable on everything. So I can imagine that's also really difficult. It is. It's just, but it's fine. You know, I, I, but then the other thing is that I like to inject here and there. I'll inject, um, like we'll talk about running technique and I've been saying as long as we've been a really active channel, you know, for about two years now, uh, I'll say here and there, I'll say, Oh, such and such and such. Uh, and I'll say something about like overstriding and then I'll go, but that's for another time. And that, that other time has yet to come. Right. So at some point I need to get into that, but it's, it's just because I, I think I get, so I feel very passionate. You know, if, if people in the chat room don't know, I used to, uh, work for Newton running. Um, and so a large part of that at the time, it no longer is a large part of that was the passion of that company built around running properly and proper technique and proper form and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I learned a lot and I, I learned so much, um, and it was really awesome. But at the same time, it's one of those things where I can go into a room, probably like I'm doing right this second and mm -hmm. talk to somebody and their eyes glaze over really quickly when I start talking about running form and technique. You know, somebody asked me the other day, hey, I'm this tall, I weigh this much, I run this much, I've been wearing this, recommend a shoe. And I wrote like a six page thing in a Facebook chat. So it's like, it's tricky, you know? I have two lives uh, here in Los Angeles. There's the acting and the comedy world, mm. the people that I, I see occasionally, uh, at least once a week I'm rehearsing and performing comedy in the area. And then there's this running life where I'm running with people and talking about ultras or talking about marathons and gear. And lately there's been a bit of crossover. Like I'll yeah. post a photo of me finishing Cascade and then a lot of people in the comedy world are like, what? What is, you what? You ran a hundred miles? Like what, <laughs> this is, what? Tell me about this. And I'll sit there and I'll start telling them a bit about the story or kind of how the day unfolded. And you'll see that same moment where they just kind of go, I don't, I'm no <laughs> longer with you, bro. You lost me at a hundred miles. Like, yeah. You lost me. Uh, and I'll have to just kind of, well, it was a cool day. All right, let's get back to performing. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's really strange. And I imagine, yeah, it's a lot, lot similar, very similar to you and, and running gear and stuff like that. Uh, there was a question, or no, what was it? A comment about, getting to see a ginger runner blooper video. And if I ever laugh at any of my own footage, I don't think I'll ever post that kind of stuff. because <laughs> I, I tend to go down rant paths where I'll say something and like, that was the meanest thing you could have ever have said about a shoe or an individual you have never met. <laughs> like <laughs> who designed this piece of crap? You know, that kind of thing. I'm like, that just does nobody any good. And as much as I'd love to post it, I think it would just do, it, it would do more harm than it would. Uh, benefit anybody. Do you yeah. ever find yourself going down that path, Brandon, where the honesty uh, might be a little too deep? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you get into that, and then that's one of those things where people have asked this. They're like, "Well, don't you?" It seems like everything that you write. It, it, you know what we do. Number one is when we do a review at Gears. If we're going to say something negative about a product, I try to kind of make a positive sandwich. You know, there's got to be something positive to say on the front side, Be have the critique and then say something positive on the back side. Even if it's like, well, this was okay. I really, this wasn't bad. I, I like this. This sucked and it's pretty, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so right. finding, finding that balance is fine. But I also find that it helps that I write when I'm doing the videos because I'm primarily the only one that does our videos. When I'm doing the videos, it helps that I've written it first. Um, so that when I'm writing it, it's a much longer process, you know, and I can, I can call myself out a little bit on that, uh, if that makes any sense. So yeah, I, I find I, I get critical here or there, but more often than not, I'm critical of myself because I only recently got a, uh, D60, Canon D60, is that a thing? Yeah. New camera. Uh, yeah. uh, 60D, yeah. one of those 60, Yeah, with the flip around screen. So now I can actually see what the hell I'm doing. And I just like, oh, yeah, there's a whole lot of name calling and it's all me talking to me. <laughs> you will learn to stop looking at the little monitor because yeah. it, it took it took a number of reviews before I went. I have been staring at the side monitor and I need to be looking into the lens. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to get pretty mad at myself uh, just because of how I'm talking or a sentence structure or something. No. It's like, why did you say that sentence like that? That makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, and someone's saying, do a live review. 
I don't think that'll happen because I, 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 I like to be able to formulate my thoughts yeah. uh, a little bit more structured. And as much as I'd love to do a live review, I think I'd save, I save the live shows to interview the guests and make myself look like an idiot that way rather than with a, with a product. I thought about periscoping a run yesterday, but then I would have had to have hashtagged it, hashtag douche for myself. Thank so. you. I've done that. I've been periscoped a run. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate it. Did you really? I've done it multiple times, Brandon. I thought I was going to lose. <laughs> I've done it a lot. Uh, yes, but here's the thing. Here's broke. the thing. You are cooler than I am. Wait, what camera were you using? Oh, my, my iPhone. I, I oh. can't. I can't use the front facing camera and record video anymore. The mic doesn't work for some reason. I think it's probably all the sweat that's gotten into uh, my phone, but the mic doesn't work. So I can't do Periscope anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody's asking if Gearist, if we have any products coming out. So <clears throat> yeah, we're working on it. Um, I'm thinking about a technical trucker, uh, working with Boco gear on that. Um, the trick is this, is that we don't have the budget to, as Ethan can probably tell you guys, I'm assuming it's expensive to buy things up front. It's really yeah. expensive. Yeah. So we fortunately worked out a way with Boco Gear, where which is a local company to us. Um, we can go to them. We can create something. We can sell it, and they won't charge us until they go to production. So basically, if we sell an entire run, and then we have the cash from the people that I say cash. I don't, that sounds impersonal, but you know what I mean? We have the money that is coming in from people that have purchased that thing. We can turn around and pay for it. That's the only way that we're going to be able to do it right now. So I'm trying to get that out uh, by the end of October. So that's a goal um, is to do that. We've thought about the net gator, not buff. We don't want to call it a buff. Um, but I don't want to, I'm, I try to be wary and I know that Ethan, you probably could give a crap, but I try to be wary of doing exactly what other people do. Um, because I just don't want to, I don't want to steal. I, 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 you know, it's, it's enough that I'm not the first person doing a review in the world. Um, but I don't want to, you know, Ethan has a fantastic buff and that every, not a buff, excuse me, neck gator. We can't, yeah. <laughs> not a buff. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> <laughs> neck gator <laughs> and i don't i just I, i'd love to do one of those but i i don't want to um simply because of that so we've thought about um some other things especially since the ginger runner neck gator is so do you call it a wrap or neck gator it's going to be a wrap because i'm going to release a wrap video with the new wrap and it's going to be a wrap wrap wow. it, sounds, it sounds hilarious right it's it i does. promise it will be it will be uh you should have sad secrets of the wrap oh god <laughs> <laughs> they don't know about that, Brandon. They don't know about oh, that. Oh, sorry. Or Methan. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I thought about some shirts and things like that. But I kind of want it to be unique also. Like Boko Gear is cool. They're technical truckers. They can do sublimated patterns around the backside of the mesh. You know, um, it's meant to be run in. It's meant to be sweated in. So that's unique to me. I don't want to just then take a tech shirt that anyone can get and throw that out the door with something on it. So I want it to be cool. But Again, the cost is a major uh, barrier to that. So, yeah, it's um, uh, it was the <clears throat> biggest hurdle to try to overcome with the first round uh, of wraps because you like I just don't have the money to to up like to put um, uh, the first round. I actually think I did. I think I did a hundred, and I paid for those, and they sold out like within th three seconds. I think. So then I knew, okay, well, I have to up my number. And there was just no, I couldn't afford it. There was no way uh, to be able to afford upfront costs on that kind of thing. So then I did the pre-order and I did the pre-order with the hats as kind of a, a second round of, of new gear that I wanted to create. Uh, I don't think I'll do it again purely because the hats took so long to manufacture. Uh, and depending on who you go through to manufacture the products, mm -hmm. I'm sure Boco is, is great uh, because mm -hmm. they're a local company. So you could even just go down the street and pound on their door and say like, where are my hats? Uh, I'm sure that they're they're fantastic with that, but I don't want to make people pay one month and then wait three months to receive. Right. It. I'd much rather it be maximum of like a week or two, you know. Right. So so they're still conscious of what they ordered, and it's not like a oh I paid him you know twenty bucks six months ago, and I'm so pissed that he never got me his the the product or whatever. So I don't want to run into that problem again. So yeah, Boco said that 
I think they said, you know, once we have the orders in, so the, the order, the, the issue then becomes how quickly do the orders come in? Because if I'm running a period of ordering for three weeks, then that means that the first person in orders could be waiting for three weeks, but Boko can turn them around in three days right. so or less. So it's not a huge deal for them. Um, but that just means that I have to keep the order period to like two weeks or something like that. But anyway, that's boring businessy stuff. So uh, yeah, we're working on it. I, I want to do some cool stuff and I'd love to, uh, yeah. At, at the end of the day, I'd love to own a company that manufactures really cool shit. But you're talking about an entire, unless one of you guys watching right now is it, you know, works for a millionaire like, or a VC firm or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's been on the ten year plan uh, since I started this whole thing. And I know you and I have talked about it too. And yeah. it, in my mind, I'm like, it seems so easy. Uh, you know, I have all these ideas for the tech shirts and the shorts and the hats and the gear and like making a kit. It's it's not easy if you don't have Ooh. money. So yeah, so that's a whole that's a whole another show, a whole another conversation. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna let everyone go. Uh, thank you again, Brandon, for for jumping in here and talking to us tonight about gear and about all sorts of things, the business, the backside of of reviewing and and all that kind of thing. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We got to get you back on again. Uh, remind people where they can find you, and where they can subscribe. You can go to gearist.com. I think thegearist.com also works, but. Uh, youtube.com slash the gearist please subscribe please tell your friends if you guys want any uh you know robbie in the chat room asked for any he i guess is uh, runs a shop if you want to promote please promote both of us ethan me anybody you know shout out i'm happy to send you guys some stuff uh to promote gearist i would really really appreciate that so and and again twitter and instagram at the gearist shout at me we're actually beginning a campaign called start here that's going to be coming up pretty soon, which is going to be all about before you go out there and you're um, really before you go out there for your next adventure, whatever that is, whether it's a run or a ski or a ride or a bike or ride a bike would be the same thing or swim or climb or whatever it is. Before you do that, start here and uh, we'll help you kind of get your gear selected. So keep an eye out for that and just uh, say hi. We'd love to hear from you guys. And thank you, Ethan, for having me. I really, really yeah. honestly appreciate it. Of course. And everyone watching live tonight can can technically say they started here. They started right here because that's when you Boom. told them to start here. So they started here. That, oh, chisel. That, that's just so <laughs> meta. That's so meta. Uh, so go, yeah, go follow Brandon. Go subscribe to his channel. Go show him some love. Um, you guys are always really fantastic about doing that. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you tuning in every single Monday live at 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and if you missed it, watch the archive version, which means you probably are watching it if you just heard that and it's not Monday. Wow. <laughs> My brain totally fried. That's the Trappist beer speaking. Uh, we'll see you guys next Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here at YouTube.com slash The Ginger. Make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already and follow across social networks. Uh, we're everywhere. That's pretty much it. You guys are awesome. Get out there, train hard, race hard, or party hardest. We'll see you guys next week. That's it. Peace. Bye.